Welcome Internet to a Psychologist Casual Review. Today I want to review Selected Problems of Adolescence by Helen Dutch. And basically I felt that it was a very, very interesting read because she wrote this in the 60s and it still holds up incredibly well even virtually six decades later, which is quite a feat when you think about it. So what did I find so interesting about the book? Well, the book is a selection of articles. She calls it the monograph, which I find incredibly fascinating because it's a word we don't use that frequently. But so in this monograph, basically she talks about teenagehood and what are the elements that go through teenagehood. So she's going to be interested in many topics, mainly group formation. But not only, she's also going to be interested in gifted children and teenagers, and basically the ideal of teenagers. And all of that is going to come together in what I felt was a very, very interesting read, and um, a very, how can I say, a very kind and human way of describing teenagers. Because that's something I really like with her writing, it's just it's very non-judgmental. So this is going to be a very positive review. But the main core of what you have to understand is that in this book, she's going to present um, us with the social landscape of teenagehood in, in the 60s, which was beetle ridden <laughs> in a way, because she does talk about the Beatles. And she feels that basically teenagers tend to all act the same, dress up the same, behave the same way, to have a sense of identity in the collective. She calls that a form of masquerade, because basically that sense of identity is incredibly superficial, very on-surface kind of reactions, meaning that they don't really uh, go in deep on why they behave like that, and they even casually toss it out when someone tries to confront them on why they believe something. And that was very interesting, as I feel that with social media, of course, and YouTube, TikTok, so on and so forth, it is still very present. Teenagers still very much adopt a group identity that has codes that are very finite, but that don't seem to really correspond to the reality and the subjectivity of the individual. It's more like a group ad adherence rather than um, the true identity on subjectivity. Of course, here I'm not talking about things like sexual orientation or um, basically um, gender. I'm really talking about things that are more superficial, like, for example, uh, like in a, a rock band or like she gives examples of the Beatles. I'm not sure the Beatles were rock, so don't quote me on this. But anyway, she basically says that those forms of identities for example, how they dress, how they identify with a peer group is not really necessarily um, going to be what they're going to become, but the transitionary phase, because basically teenagers are incredibly anxious at the core. That anxiety is something in which they have to struggle with, because basically she interprets it as they haven't yet attained a new form of superego and ideal ego, which is stabilized, meaning that they're still building it and they're still in an uncomfortable situation because the one they inherited, they inherited during childhood is not yet um, fully, um, fully operational because basically it's being deconstructed, meaning the values of the culture and of the father by extension. Basically, um, are being disconstructed, are being taken out of the frame, and they have to find a new ideal ego, something to look forward to, an ideal to aspire to. And that's what they ha happens to happen when they go into groups. They start creating a new ideal, which not, is not necessarily corresponds to who they are, but it's something that they can that they can feel a sense of belonging. And that's very interesting and very important. As she states, and I found the expression very, very good and very, very profound, they have an identity card, we, 
and that identity card we is basically um, the adherence to a group of younglings and young people like them. Maybe not younglings, but young people. And that's something that's incredibly interesting and I found she explained it really well. And it was something very contemporary of her time, meaning the Beatles, which she doesn't necessarily understand, but through her clinical experience and through the young people she met, she was able to understand it. And I found that to be a very good example for psychoanalysis themselves, which often tend to be into the past, try and analyze what has happened in the decades, and sometimes even what Freud felt, but they're not necessarily in the present. And she was in the present at that very point, in something that was so incredibly new, like the Beatles. And she was analyzing it. And for her, this group identification is also has the bonus of preventing anxieties linked with the fear of death. Because according to her, the fact of identifying with all of this group creates two sins. First and foremost, it allows a teenager to basically um, have this fundamental um, bisexuality. Because she says that basically when men have long hair and women dress up as boys but don't really feel like boys, it's not transgenderism, it's more to do with how they play with their identity. There is a fundamental bisexuality that is addressed. And that bisexuality, which is very interesting, is condensation of both mother and father figure within them. And basically it creates this feeling of having both and being in a way immortal. And I found that very interesting on an unconscious level, of course, to link bisexuality with feelings of immortality or, I can say, protections against death. That would be more the case. And she also says that there is um, intense, intense anxiety uh, in teenagers, which is the, the anxiety of death, of dying without achieving anything. And she says that basically, that's why they're so pressed to become someone, to become famous or, or notorious or even an expert in certain areas, because they are fundamentally afraid to cease to be, to achieve nothing, that their life is quote-unquote meaningless. So they have to force themselves into a way of feeling that they can achieve so much, because basically they're so afraid of their life being cut short. And that's also something very interesting. And I think that even though she never really fundamentally talks about it, there might be also a cultural element, because it was in the midst of the Cold War, there was the Vietnam War also, which he touches upon. And I feel that all of that creates a sense of anxiety, which she does not necessarily address directly, but you can feel the outlines that are there. So basically, um, she has a very, very interesting point of view on how these things develop. She also has a whole perspective on gifted children meaning children that are beyond average in terms of intelligence, that they um, have very good capacities. But she says that basically those children do not always equate to geniuses, as we would believe, because basically uh, those children build themselves in with the help of their parents, and mainly the mother. And what she says is that when the mother overemphasizes intellectuality and the ability to be intelligent or smart, it makes the child invest 100% into this. But in, by investing in his intellectual abilities, he also kind of um, pushes out the emotional connections. Meaning for Dutch, that an emotional connection is relegated to the background, meaning that they, in later life, they will not necessarily be fully able to connect with others. And that lack of connection is also going to be felt within their creativity, meaning that, that they might be very good at learning things, but they might not be as good with their creative output, which is something that I found very interesting. And in terms of output, she does state that basically it's sometimes also better to say that um, you will, for a parent to say, you will achieve better than me. Or on the contrary, I think it's going to be hard for you, as those elements create a sense of um, 
repère, we would say in French, meaning that basically you know where you're going. Um, a bit like a lighthouse in the middle of a storm. Like those are things where the teenager can direct himself with, and that's something that's very interesting, I think very, very relevant. She also has this whole idea about sexuality, that for her, the sexual freedom that was gained by the, um, at, the po at that point, contemporary youth, is also a facade, because basically they do not feel that much freer. And that revolt is not a deep revolt, but it's more of a surface revolt against the previous generation, because that's what's complicated with teenagehood. It's basically you're stuck between you're not a child anymore, and society demands of you to have your identity, and also you have a generation above you that basically has its own rules and sets of values. So it's always a, a tension between regressive elements and progressive elements in the story of the person, meaning that it's always going to have to be um, conflict between going forward and, in a way, pushing the, the other generation away and also being dependent upon that generation. And she also, interestingly enough, says that basically it's a fight, a struggle, both on a social level to gain um, a level of adulthood and at the core, um, an, instabili an instability where they do not know who they really are yet. And that's something that I found very, very interesting and very, very true even nowadays. Of course, there would be a thousand other sins to talk about, but it still remains very true that emotional and identity instability where sins are being tried out, they may or may not match, but they're still there. She also talked about, very interestingly, about sexuality and its role within teenagehood. Basically, for her, she did not see sexual freedom as that great. I mean, she felt that it was a good thing that they were able to have sex. She was not repressive at all. But for her, sexuality had to be linked with love. And basically, people that had sex without any emotion, just as a way to prevent anxiety or something that the peer group would do, would often um, hurt those people because they were not following their true desires, but they were acting in accordance to a masquerade. And that's something that I found to be of high interest. She also says that teenagers that invest everything into sex might, um, might, that might lower their intellectual understanding as not that they become less smart, but because all the energy is deployed onto the sexual sphere, basically, they have no more time to invest in intellectualness, in sublimation, in a way. She doesn't say sublimation, but that's what I got out of it, meaning that they can't transform the sexual drives into learning anymore. And last point, but not the least, she talked about um, infantilism, meaning the um, fact that at the core, certain people uh, cannot tolerate frustration, and that's something you see in teenagehood, and that's something that is a marker of sins that are going to become much harder on both an emotional level and on a societal level, because basically those people have um, a very low threshold in terms of what they can bear of a feeling of pressure or a feeling that basically they have to appease the drives incredibly fast and incredibly well. Basically, the pleasure uh, principle overrides the reality principle, meaning that everything has to be in the here and now, which makes things much more complicated for those people and for the families. And I found that very interesting, as we are in a culture right now where the here and now, the getting everything in the snap of a finger, is very, very common. And I feel that her observations still hold very true that if you're not able or if you have issues delaying gratification and might cause massive problems both for academic achievement of course but also for professional life and for life itself because delaying something is also what constitutes the, the space the space that will allow reverie 
and even intellectualization. So I think she had very, very good points, and she was a joy to read. And she was also very human. Like, you can feel that in her writing, she really tried to um, understand teenagers and really be there with them. Beyond the psychoanalytic framework, she really invested of her person to be able to help them in a very humanistic way, I felt. So that marks the end of it. That's everything I had to say. I hope you liked the video and I'll see you in the next one.